Yeah. Shoot. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, good start. <laughs> All right. Let me just mute this. Hold on. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Emerge Gallery. Uh, my name is Roger Langton, and I'm really, really pleased to have Veronica Lawler here today uh, and to uh, be exhibiting her work uh, as part of Material Memory. Uh, I met Veronica, uh, it's been a couple of years now through uh, exhibiting some of the group shows. Um, and, um, you know, I, we did some online work um, and I, I just, uh, you know, her work is wonderful. It's just, you won't know. Uh, I went to visit her at uh, Burcliff when she was doing an artist in residency. She was working on the uh, Brickyard series, uh, which I fell in love with the oranges. You know, I just <laughs> love, the, love the colors. I actually had an orange show uh, a couple years ago, um, and I kept thinking, I would love to do this show in a gallery because a lot of orange on these white walls would look great. So I didn't do an orange show, but I got my wish. Um, <laughs> So uh, it was a really great project. Uh, it very, very local. Um, you know, we, we have a huge um, uh, history here in the in the Hudson Valley of, of brick making, um, as as both Andy and, and Veronica will, will tell you. Um, so I don't want to take up much time. We're going to turn it on to uh, turn it over to them. We're going to hear Veronica talk about her work. Andy talk about some of the brickyards. And um, we're going to have Kelly join us by Zoom who did the fabrication of the glass. Uh, so welcome, Brian. Take it away. Thank you, uh, Robert. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, I think I would love to ask you to start, Andy, because uh, so much of this work is about the brickyards of the Hudson Valley. And um, I think uh, I met Andy last summer. Uh, when, as Robert says, I was here for an artist residency at Burcliff. And um, I had, when I came to the residency, I had already been in this project on this side of the gallery uh, about the Pathiasco Bridge demolition for a few years. And when I was fortunate to receive the um, residency at Burcliff, I thought, you know, I, I wanted to do something similar in a way to talk about the history of this area. And so, um, you know, I started doing some research into brickyards, into the, the huge history of the brick industry uh, here in the Hudson Valley, um, because as Andy will tell you in more expert terms than I, uh, the clay along the Hudson River is just amazing for bricks. And so there were so many factors that came together, you know, the, the expansion of New York City, uh, the proximity to the Hudson Valley of New York City. They need a lot of bricks, I'm giving a very short <laughs> overview. Anyway, uh, so I started to um, think about doing something around the abandoned brickyards in terms of the history and what it meant to this area, what it meant to New York City, what it meant to me personally as someone who grew up in New York. Every building I've ever lived in was built with Hudson River bricks and you know as you start uncovering history you start seeing how much it affects your life now and i you know my interest in history has always been the emotional part of history and the people and the feelings and all of that good juicy stuff that doesn't somehow make it into history books is what i really like to talk about so i came to bird cliff and um i was looking for old brickyards to draw. My, my work is based always with drawing on location. That's the way I was sort of raised as an artist. Some of you here <laughs> know this about me as you also were raised that way. Um, and so I started to draw on site at uh, some of the brickyards. I went to the Hutton Brickyard, which is now uh, a beautiful event space, but they've kept some of the original brick sheds and the literary crane. And so I drew there, and then I was looking for um, uh, the brickyards of Malden, and I knew that Staples Yard was there, and there was a big, a lot of uh, factories still left, and uh, that is when Robert put me in touch with Andy Vanderpoel, who is known in this area as a brick collector, and um, he was kind enough to meet with me and bring me 
by canoe on the Hudson to some great spots for drawing and research. And um, so thank you for that, Andy. It was very generous of him. And I would like to introduce him now, and he's going to speak to you a little bit about the history of brickyards here in the Hudson Valley and his own collection, which is extensive, and I'll let him talk about it soon. All right, very good, thank you. I'm Andy Vanderpool. I'm from Sorgates. I grew up here. I went to the elementary school right down the street here, which is a nice brick building, by the way. <laughs> I graduated from there, graduated from Sorgates High School, which is just down Washington Avenue. Then I taught there for the next 33 years. So I'm a local, I'm as local as they get. I grew up about a mile and a half from here on the south side of the village. And from where I grew up, I could walk down to the river through the woods. And I could walk down by um, East Bridge Street, which back then was all old industrial, old brick buildings, all abandoned at this time. And it just seemed like everywhere I went along in my travels, you know, and I didn't realize it at the time, it wasn't until later on, everywhere I went, there was always abandoned brick buildings, you know, it was unavoidable. And some of them were brickyards in, in uh, the Washburn Yard down in Glasgow, the Staples Yard up here. Everywhere you went, it seemed like there were bricks and brick buildings and brick yards. So at some point, you know, early on, I was busy with my family and the children and all that. But at some point, when you get a little more free time, I was always a big fan of the Hudson, and then I was always reading about the Hudson. And then at one point, I read George Hutton's um, the great uh, Hudson River brickmaking industry. So I read that book. And almost every, that book was written by somebody in Kingston. So everything in there is basically local. At the time, my daughter's maybe 10 years old. It's at the end of the winter. I said, Molly, you want to go for a ride? Let's go look for some bricks. So she's 10 years old. Nice day out. Let's. I got all, uh, as much time as I want here. You take I think I'm gonna talk about that. You want me to go ten minutes? How old is Molly gonna be? So Molly and I go out. We go. Um, we go down to Fort Ewan to the Schlieg yard. We find some bricks. So we have some success. So we come up to the Fort Ewan village. Find a few more bricks. And all of this is mentioned in the, in the book. So now it's something like an Easter egg hunt. You know, here they are, go find it. So then we go find it. Then we go to the Hutton Yard, find some more bricks to come home. So that was pretty much the end of it for Molly, but me, the hook was in deep. You know, so I kept going. I got into the internet, I got into the history of the brickyards. I found out more. You know, that was just inevitable that you're going to find out more about it. But so where I ended up with this is. I collected Hudson River bricks and so this is my garage. These are all from the Hudson River. So these will be on the floor. I don't want to do anything here about Veronica's work. I don't want to block anybody's view of that. This is obviously secondary, but this is the Hudson River. <laughs> this map shows you where all the brickyards were located. The high water mark would be 1905. From the, um, Veronica mentioned that there was two big fires in New York City, 1835, 1845. Building code came in, they couldn't build with wood anymore. So they needed a fireproof material. Brick was the answer. There was lots of play in the Hudson River Valley. You had a huge demand for the bricks. Was, New York City was growing like crazy. The uh, Irish potato famine figured into this. You had a huge influx of labor. You didn't want to work at the brickyard. If that was the only job you could get, that's what you took. But it was long hours. It was backbreaking work. The pay wasn't good. But uh, you could get employment there. So if you just came over here and you had nothing, that would have been better than nothing. So you actually, <laughs> if you look at this, you do see a lot of Irish names in here because a lot of times people would work in a brickyard and maybe uh, you know earn some money, keep some money, make some investments, and uh, ultimately get into a partnership but um so there's a huge irish influence with this so going from the end of the civil war i would say up till 1910 it just you know there were good years and bad years but the general trend was that the brick making industry was a profitable one 
After that, there was lots of different reasons for the decline, which we're not going to get into everything. If you have questions afterwards, I'm certainly glad to uh, answer to the best of my ability. But the remnants from all this industry is that there's these bricks everywhere. And at one time, the, the, again, the high water mark, there would have been 135 different yards working at that season on the river. All the bricks would be going down to the city for the most part via large, via the Hudson River. You know, cheap, uh, cheap transportation, the natural products were here, you had the source of labor. So it was basically the perfect storm for this industry to take off as it did. So. The names on the bricks, are those um, the manufacturers, the, yes. uh, the factories? That... Yeah, early on, as far as collecting goes, I'm just going to put it down. You wanna... Yeah, I'll hold it. Early on, they didn't mark their bricks. And from a collecting standpoint, we call those vanilla. So if you see a brick that has no markings, that's a vanilla. It's an older brick. And when I say older, probably pre-Civil War. Then they started marking their bricks. And... And I don't know if I have any examples here. I don't see any off the top of my head. But uh, they, when they first started marking the bricks, they would put it into the brick mold the correct way. So it would then come out backwards on the brick. So it took them a little bit of time to figure out what's going on. So that you actually see some that were, it's mostly correct with a backward letter or two or backwards and or saying, but you do see that too and the other thing that's worth uh, mentioning is the older bricks they don't have a frog they're just flat on both sides later on this depression with the letters in there that's called a frog and that did a couple things it preserved some of the clay it made for a better bond with the mortar when they would put the brick into the wall or whatever it was but uh, and that as the years went along, the frog got deeper and deeper. It started out shallow, started out with no frog, shallow, and then deeper and deeper. And if you look here, you can probably find some of that. But uh, are you still finding the older, older bricks? Are they still it gets, coming up? I mean, for me, it gets more and more difficult to find a brick. I did find one this spring, which it's kind of an interesting story. You want to hear an interesting story? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> Just south of Glasgow. Back in the day, that was called Portersville. And we found bricks there with that say W Porter. No frog, old brick, very small letters. Well, this spring, I found the brick that said WWP. And I had one WWP early on in my career. I attributed it to Washburn, Worrell, and Palmer, because that's in one of the books. Mm -hmm. But now that I found this brick this spring at this particular location, it, I now know that that was wrong because that area being Portersville, son of a gun, you know what? The guy across the street, does that say W Porter up there? One of these buildings across the street says W Porter, and that's this guy. And I knew his name was Wellington Porter, but I couldn't find out his middle name or his middle initial. I had a suspicion his middle initial was W, but I didn't know what it was. I go to a public library. I can't find it. I can't find it. I get in touch with the town historian, uh, Audrey Klinkenberg. Mm -hmm. She gets back to me the next day, and I don't tell her what's going on. I said, I need to know Wellington Porter's middle name. She gets back to me the next day, it's Wakely. Oh, I said, son of a gun. So this is not Washburn Morella Palmer. It's Wellington Wakely Porter, you know? So then I, there's a guy who has a brick list for the entire country. I have to email wow. him. <laughs> He's like, okay, it's stuff like that that comes out of this. You know, no one was ever going to care other than one of these brick circles. So that's, you know, it's just something that comes out of this. But when you leave here, looking at, across the street, there's one of these buildings that says W. Porter. That's that guy. That's that guy. That's that guy. And they didn't ask you why you needed to know him. <laughs> I know, right? Because if I know that this brick says WWP, I knew it was Wellington, Porter, Wakely. I just needed to know that was him. I knew it was him, but I right, needed right. confirmation. <laughs> and so that, but that, you know, as you get more and more and more of these bricks to find something that you don't have, that gets more and more difficult That's as exciting. you would expect, yeah. you know. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I, I have a quick question for you. So this only served New York State and New York City? For and the most part, yes. I mean, New Jersey, you could say some went over there. And New Jersey had brickyards too. Um, the Sayreville, that was a big brick making area. And those went into the uh, New York City area as well. But by and large, yes, most of the Hudson River bricks were sent down the river to the mm -hmm. New York City area. So by the compound of each brick, mm -hmm. let's say you went to California, the compounds of bricks in California would be completely different. They would definitely be different. You know, they all have clay in it, what percentage and what, how much iron is in the clay. That, you know, throughout the Hudson River Valley, it's pretty consistent. But if you go to, to the far, you know, to the California, yeah, you're definitely going to get different compositions. Wow. Absolutely. Go ahead. What's, what's the basic reason for the decline of the brick industry? The, there were several, but I'll give you a few of them. The biggest ones were building materials were changing. Concrete block was a big one. You could get mm -hmm. one concrete block would take up 12 bricks. People were preferring glass and steel with the high rises. So the bricks were out in that regard. Bricks kind of got a bad rap. They said, oh, they don't weather as well. But I don't know that that was really true, but that was the perception at the time. So they got away from the bricks. You know, Haverstraw was a big brick making area. It was actually the biggest in the world for a period of time. That area definitely completed their clay banks. Mm -hmm. A lot of those brickyard owners came up river. Washburn was one. They were in the Haverstraw area. They came up to Kingston and Sorgerties. But, you know, up, up river, there's still plenty of clay. But it was the most important aspect of that would be the changing of the preferred building materials. Yeah. All right, I'm going to put this back down. That's not too important. Thank you. Environmental uh, protection came to play too, right? Because of the yeah, they wanted them to upgrade the plants and yeah. it wasn't cost effective for some of them, so they opted just to shut, to shut down. down. Yeah. How many bricks do you have? I honestly don't know. It's a lot. <laughs> it's around 360 in that neighborhood. Could you make something with them? Like, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I have a fire pit in the backyard with my extras. I made a nice little patio out there with the faces up. So, but then I didn't bring the bricks like my friends over the next day. I got bricks missing from the past. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I'm going to be, you want to stay up here? Like, Whatever you want to talk about. All right, I'll sit back there. I want you to have a great show. And Excellent. Thank you, Andy. <laughs>
um, evenly heated. And if it would overheat, it could start to form an almost glass-like substance. And so this is really just thinking about the energy and the power and the transformation of materiality that was controlled by the people who worked in the brickyards. Um, so that's, that's this. This is a drawing uh, of one of the brick sheds that is at the Hutton Yards, which is now, I was talking to somebody earlier, this is now a really beautiful event space in Kingston, but they have kept uh, several of the original brick sheds there and the old Lidgerwood crane. And so this is one of the drawings that led to this whole series. Let's keep going. So this, this whole section of paintings here is called Nature Reclaiming. And um, one of the things that I really loved when I was drawing on site at these abandoned brickyards was the way nature is taking over the space and reclaiming the space. And it just, you know, it's it seemed very poetic to me. These places that used to produce bricks are now, the production is nature, right? It's like the new production, the new fire is creation. And so these combinations uh, are about that. This one is called <laughs> furnace budding, yes. Um, and so you see the, the bricks and the fire of the furnace, but also nature with the same power, right? And it's a slower transformation, but actually a more powerful transformation. And all of these are also about that. Um, and that's why this whole series, this one is called Flowering Furnace. Um, these are, this is growth, new production, uh, and they're all very layered because I also wanted to, um, you know, it's painting, it's collage, it's fabric, there's scratching, it's, there's a lot of layering that goes on in these particular paintings because I also wanted to talk about the process of layering, right? And these plants that are, you know, the seeds are in the ground waiting in a way <laughs> for this opportunity. To, to come forth and, and take over again. And there's a whole movement uh, called wilding that's going on, you know, allowing the land to just to go back to the way it was originally. And to me, this is kind of a great aspect or something to, to think about also, you know, this, these kind of rural plants that just come in and, and take over and heal the land, uh, essentially. So that's what all of these are talking about. And if, you know, as I'm talking, if anyone has questions, you can just sort of ask. Don't be shy. I, I know a lot of shy. Anyway, yes. Yes, Neil. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you, did you uh, make drawings that, like you have the drawing there that kind of kicked off the that section yeah um, your that's a good question there well there are some there's a book over there with some drawings okay. and there i made drawings of what was actually there right. you know the plants coming through and um, there's a few in this corner too mm -hmm. that show that um and then these these paintings came from those drawings in mm -hmm. the sense of like thinking about it but also like little sections of the drawing where i would see that that power and the mm -hmm. kind of push of the plant and so Yes, yes and no, I yes. guess is the answer. Yeah, yeah, okay. The material, mm -hmm. is it, is it, oh, that one. just talk about the this one. Yeah, this one has, um, so this one, thank you, Neil. This one is, I'm really asking. yeah, no, I, <laughs> I can tell yeah, no, um, yeah, this one has acrylic paint um, and it's been layered and scratched and painted over. And these are painted papers that are collaged on. This is, um, this is like uh, gouache paint on paper. This is ink and gouache. Um, and these are some plant shapes that I had. And um, some of this, there's some, this is fabric here. There's little pieces of fabric, sort of printed leaves from old, old mid-century fabrics that I incorporated. This has a little uh, pattern from um, some Japanese papers that I have printed patterns. So, you know, it's funny when you're when you're working and there are things around the studio, they find their way <laughs> into the work. Oh no, that's perfect. Let me grab that. Yeah, this one has this one has a lot of fabric and, and paper combined, and there's a little piece of fabric here. So this is perfect for this piece here. This, yeah. So this yeah. this is yeah, this one I, I drew that specifically for that. There are a lot of this came out of um the sheds at the Hutton uh 
it's called Hutton Brickyards still now, uh, but the, the old sheds, if you look inside, it's like a jungle inside each one. And it has a lot of fern plants. And so that's, this was sort of drawing, thinking about those ferns and how they're taking over. Yes, William. Oh, I like that whole section mm -hmm. just because of the fact that it reminds me of like how um, nature gives us basically energy to like build all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then when we don't have any use for it anymore, it kind of just takes it back. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. It's pretty smart. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I like that section for that reason too. Yeah. That's kind of what I, that's what I was thinking about a lot. You know, there's wisdom in that, right? And we, in a way, in a way, there's these, these factories destroy the land and then people left and now the land is like, okay, we'll fix it. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's good. Thanks. Um, okay. Let's sit back here. So, um, Oh yeah, sorry, it's so cramped in here. There's usually not this many people in the gallery sitting down at once. <laughs> um, yeah, so this section here, uh, I called the factory and the workers. And um, you know, Andy was talking a little bit about the back, the back breaking work of uh, working in the brickyards, especially in the early days. You know, it became more and more automated. Uh, over the years, although I, I would say it probably was never easy work to do, but in the early days, they would dry the bricks by hand. They would lay all the bricks out, right? And then people would walk like, and be like this all day long, turning the bricks and turning the bricks so they would dry. Mm -hmm. And so these, these drawings here, I was thinking about that, you know, the physicality of doing that all day. And, you know, as well as being exposed to the heat, of the furnace and the fumes and the, the smoke. And so these are sort of how the, the workers and the technology came together and became sort of like one organism in a sense. And so these have this figurative aspect, but I didn't want to get too literal with that because I, I wanted to really, I didn't want to talk about one person. I wanted to talk about this whole group of people mm -hmm. who, in a way, they, not in a way, they did. They sacrificed their bodies for this world that we live in, you know, in, in a way of thinking about it. Um, you know, as, as Andy was saying, it was tough work, but if you needed to eat that, you could work in the brickyards and you could do that. And um, again, I, you know, I have this, this sort of sense of this forgotten group of people that we really, we rest on. And so I, I this is something I, I really actually want to continue to, to work with and think about, um, but this is kind of the start of that, that kind of thinking. Um, and so these are also mixed media, just to talk about the art a little bit. Um, this is acrylic paint and charcoal and pastel and ink, um, paper collage. This one has a little bit of brick dust in it as well. So it's you know very much the tactility of the, of the arts. Um, these two are, are, again, back to talking about the process. This is uh, called the chimney. Um, you know, there was, uh, when, they were, when they were crossing the fires and when they were firing the bricks, the, the goal was for the bricks to release, one of the goals, obviously, was for the bricks to release any moisture that was, you know, inside in the pores. And that moisture, they called it water smoke. And so that's, this is sort of that water smoke coming out of the chimney. And I, I'm not positive, but I think that the water smoke was part of the issue with the smoke feelings related to uh, the EPA and one of the one of the factors in the demise of the bird industry here. Uh, this is called Vervalen, and um, there's a named Richard Vervalen who uh, invented a brick making machine that was totally automated and it can, did it in 1852, I think, and it, it really uh, increased production in the Hudson Valley. And so this one, you also see some greenery. And so again, I'm thinking of as the factories are left, the increased production of nature. And so it's kind of like a nice metaphor. <laughs> um, these are some drawings. These are, these are done at the Hutton Yards. This is the Lidgerwood Crane. 
uh, that again automated made things smoother rather than taking the bricks by wheelbarrow to the river. They could lift them with these cranes. This is a boiler that um, I first saw when Andy took me on a canoe ride last summer. Uh, this is in Malden at the old Staples Yard. And here, this one, you see nature really sort of encompassing the, the boiler as it sits in the forest. Yeah. I'll just move this yeah. out of the way. Okay. A little water. Yeah. So this back wall, um, excuse me, it's called the Machine Age. And um, really, uh, thinking about process, the, the processes of, of uh, the transformation of material. You know, I mean, this is the idea of the show being called material memories. It's really about how material keeps transforming. And so this is the process and this is really kind of um, about the river and the clay coming up from the river and then these circular shapes and the gears. Um, you know, and even the circular shapes in the boiler, this is a lot of the shapes really representing the, the shift and the change, right, from one material to the other. So this one is called the process. This is the machine age, um, you know, which again is all part of the world that created our world, right, that we sort of rest on. Um, this is a drawing from the Hutton Brickyard. This is the, the, one of the brick sheds from the side. This is another drawing. drawing. <laughs> My hair tied up. Uh, drawing of the boiler. <laughs> that like the drawing over here. Um, <laughs> these two paintings. Uh, this was uh, based on Denning's Point, which was the first uh, brickyard that I visited before I actually was up here in the Hudson Valley working before my residency. Um, I went. This is in Beacon, New York. And um, there's really not much left um, of this brickyard, uh, but it was a you know there's enough there to sort of get the sense of what had happened. This is this is like the old furnace and energy, and you know I uh, I was there actually with a friend of mine who lives in Beacon named Dominic, and I called him. I said, Hey, Don, let's go draw the the old brickyard, and uh, we both felt this kind of just reverberation right even though there was nothing there there was so much there energy and in a way that it sort of kicked that idea off in my mind of not only the energy of the fire and the transformation of clay to brick but also the people and now again you, you see the energy of nature so it's it's this whole continuous evolution that's happening um, and this is all acrylic. Um, this is also acrylic. This is the boiler. This is probably one of the closest uh, relationships between drawing and painting in the show, just in terms of, you know, the actual imagery. So this is the painting of, I mean, sorry, this is the drawing of the boiler. And this is one of the paintings that I did based on that. Um, this is, I mean, if you if you can go over there, it's it's just amazing. This boiler sitting in the forest, it has such a presence, right? It's just like it feels alive. I, you know, a friend told me that I I tend to ascribe life to inanimate objects a lot, and I definitely do. And this boiler is like big time alive <laughs> in the forest. So that's that's uh, essentially the brickyard section of the show. Uh, actually, you want to, we've got Kelly with us now. So yeah. maybe we can transition from the brickyards to the bridge and uh, we'll talk about through the, uh, through the glass. Excellent. I love that. Great. All right. Okay. Kelly, I'm going to bring you up. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, Kelly is going to join us in five. Okay. Uh, so, um, hey, great. Kelly. So let me, let me bring you out here. I'll get out of the way. Oh, you're fine. So, um, hi Kelly, how are you? Um, good. You guys can't see her, but she's well, on the screen. <laughs> she's on the screen. Hi. <laughs> this is Kelly Krause. Uh, so, one of the things that um, I really wanted to do was to to continue this idea of transformation of material is to take some of these bricks and ask my good friend Kelly, who is a glass artist, and she does some beautiful cast glass work, if she would fabricate them in glass for us, which she did. Um, and so here we have a brick from the Hutton Yards, the Malden Yards, and a little half brick from the Staples Yards. And um, 
You Kelly, uh, I'm sorry. You want to hold I, them? I should hold them up. Yeah. This is the staples bird. Yeah, I should. Oh, here you go. <laughs> I remember each one just by looking at them. <laughs> so this one is Melvin Nooks. So yeah, they're really, they're, they're so beautiful. We were, Kelly called when she took them out of the kiln, she sent the pictures and we were like, oh my God. <laughs> They're, and they're they're pretty heavy. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I, I we thought Kelly maybe you all would like to hear Kelly talk a little bit about the process and how she how she put this together. Yeah. And then there's also yes. it, um, in the front window there's a section of the uh, of the bridge yes. uh, that that she also. She also did yes in the front yeah. window you can see we're going to talk about this side of the show which is uh, based on the the demolition and deconstruction of the Kosciuszko Bridge. And one of the things Kelly also did was cast a piece of the bridge that I uh, that I had about, about this big from the original truss bridge that she cast in glass and that's in the window. All right. Which is cool, you should check it out. <laughs> Let me, uh, let's make you the, the feature here. Great, all, all right. right. I don't know if you all, can you all hear me okay? Is that thumbs up maybe? So sorry, I couldn't be there in person. My car just got towed. Uh, I was planning to be there with you, but thankfully we have the Zoom technology to allow this. Um, but yeah, I was super excited to work with Veronica on this project. Um, I think she wanted to, and I love to share just kind of a little bit about the process of casting glass. Um, it's a lost wax casting process, which is how bronze is cast, some jewelry um, that kind of transcends different techniques, but you apply it in a very specific way to work with glass. So Veronica gave me the bricks that she had acquired, um, and I then made a rubber mold off of each of the bricks. And then from that mold, you pour wax into the rubber and then you have a wax version of the brick. And then that brick gets put in um, a high fire refractory mold, which basically means it can withstand the heat of casting. For glass casting, uh, you go up to about 1,550 degrees Fahrenheit. So the mold needs to be strong enough to go up to that temperature. And actually the way it works too, you make the mold and then you melt out the wax. So you're left with the cavity and then chunks of glass get loaded in. It goes into a kiln, it slowly heats up and then it slowly cools down. And then you have the glass object at the end. Um, yeah, and like Veronica said, they're pretty heavy. I think each brick is about uh, like 3000 kilograms of glass. Um, I'm sorry, three kilograms, 3000 grams of glass. Uh, I don't know what that is in pounds, but the math that you have to do to figure out the glass all happens in grams. That's why I know that. But yeah, it's a pretty substantial amount of glass. Um, actually, the largest brick there is the same amount of glass as the bridge piece, which I think is just kind of really interesting. Well, that's like, interesting because the hunting bricks are the jumbo bricks. I think that's a jumbo brick, right? right? Yeah, which, are, which were larger. That's which built Manchester, which yeah. is the, the building I do. Oh, okay. Yeah, I made that connection. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and then for the bridge piece, it was the same process. It was a much more complex silicone mold. It's actually the most complex silicone mold I have ever made. So it was a very fun and challenging project, um, but it turned out really, really well. And I'm very excited about it. And I finally know how to pronounce the bridge name. Thanks to Veronica. <laughs> I've lived here for over almost 11 years and never knew how to pronounce it. Um, but yeah, it was really fun. If you look at them really closely, you can see all of the detail translates through, especially on the bridge piece. You can see where like the paint was peeling up, where there was rusty moments, the bricks, all of the cracks and the little like um, pocket holes are in there. I actually realized too, in making the molds, the one brick was very kind of lumpily made. It had kind of like a an undulation to it when the, the brick itself was made that I didn't notice as intensely until I got to the wax stage. I thought I had done something wrong. Then I put them next to each other and I was like, oh no, this is, this is how the original brick was made. So there's something, I think this kind of speaks to what Veronica's intention was with this whole project. Um, when you translate an object, in this case, literally translate it 
through different steps, you kind of like learn new and different things about it. It is the same object, but you just become more aware of, I don't know, some of the different visual qualities to it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't know um, if you wanted me to talk about anything else or if anyone has specific questions, but that was kind of my, my part in this project. Um, yeah. I, I had a quick question. Did yeah. um, did you, uh, to get one perfect brick, did you need to go through multiple attempts? No, I, knock on wood, my success rate was high for all four of those pieces. It was one casting for each one. Oh, what is nice too about the silicone mold, that can be reused over and over and over again. The quality of silicone that I used, I think allows for up to like 500 pours per mold. So I could make, you know, in not infinite, but 500 of each object, but the wax, the one wax that you pour, and then the mold that goes into the kiln, that's a one time use um, step of the process. And the bricks are uh, in an addition of five, 15, uh, 15. the, the, the bridge is, is in addition of five. Yeah. All right, wonderful. Does anyone have any questions for Kelsey? Thanks, Kelsey. Okay. Thanks, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Right. Uh, yes. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we'll move on to the bridge. Yes, would you like to hear about the other? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, well, actually, if you maybe after the talk, you can take a look because the bridge piece, like Kelly was just talking about, is here. And it is actually, maybe what we could do later is just put it here for a few minutes sure. so people can look. It's really it. very cool. You can see all the wear and tear and the big bolts on the side. And um, it's really like, it is a piece of art, just the bridge piece itself. But then to yeah. see it in glass, I think it's fine. Really cool. So, okay. Um, I guess let's, I'll talk about the Asiosa bridge. So, um, this whole, you know, I've always, as I kind of was saying at the beginning of this talk, I've always been interested uh, in history and sort of the emotional side of history. Um, but this this project dealing with uh, the band and industrial spaces, which I'm continuing uh, from here, really started in 2017 when they took down the original, uh, it was built in the 1930s steel trust bridge that connected Brooklyn and Queens. Um, it's called the Kosciuszko Bridge. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, so sorry, Kelly, if I'm not, but um, it's called the Kosciuszko Bridge. And I live in Queens and I teach at Pratt in Brooklyn, so I travel over this bridge fairly frequently. Uh, and we used to say it was the bridge everyone loved to hate because the traffic it's always bad around the Kosciuszko Bridge. Mm -hmm. So in 2017, they decided, or a little bit earlier, to take down the, the Trust Bridge, and they built in its place two beautiful, um, do they call them span bridges? They're really high. They're span bridges? Cable bridge. Cable stay bridge. <laughs> uh, and they're beautiful, and the traffic's much better. But, you know, uh, as they were taking the bridge down, I was driving over and I got interested in the process and I started to make drawings. And this particular drawing here, uh, you could see a little bit, there's some tombstones uh, in the corner here because across from the site where they were tearing down this bridge is a cemetery uh, called Calvary Cemetery in Queens. And a lot, as I was standing at the edge of the cemetery drawing and taking down the bridge, I was thinking about how so many of the men who built the bridge were buried in Calvary. And I, I was like, that stinks, you know, like they're just watching their work come down and, and you know, the bridge that everyone loves to hate and there was, they weren't getting any kind of, I don't know, celebration. <laughs> so I, I said, you know, I, I, I want to do something more than draw the deconstruction. And so that's when I started making these paintings and thinking about kind of the memory of these places and the spaces in between, right? That hold the energy of these places and everything that happened. And, you know, when you draw a place, you spend a lot of time there and 
you start to feel that energy and you start to, to feel like, wow, I can tell that things happen here. And so that was the beginning of this, you know? And so I started, um, this started making these paintings. I made the drawings, I took them to my studio. I looked at the spaces in between these shapes and I thought, that's what I want to paint, that in between spot and that sort of intangible form that happened to them. So this, this grouping here is called Demolition of the Bridge. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about on the other side there, they, the first thing they did to take down the old trust bridge was what they called an energetic felling. They made almost like score lines, cuts in the bridge. They put a lot of small dynamite across it and they detonated it and the bridge pieces sort of fell like boom, like straight down. Then came the work of cutting them up and parting them away. So these paintings deal with that moment when those pieces fell, right? And it's just these massive heavy pieces are suddenly free. <laughs> Again, I'm anthropomorphizing. They're free and they're in the air, and <laughs> but, they, but they were. And, and this one here, especially, uh, it's called Demolition. And it's about that kind of moment when gravity is suspended. And this bridge that held up so much is now released and is falling and, um, so that's what these are all about. This one at the top right here is called Bridge Ribs. Um, again, you know, starting to think about the people who built the bridge and how they are part of it and, you know, the body of the bridge, the body of the workers. And, you know, when you do such physical labor, you really do get connected to, to that. Um, and the thing that was really nice is at the opening, my Aunt Rosemary was here. Um, and I won't say her age because it's on YouTube, she won't like that, but um, <laughs> she was talking about her brother Sal being one of the, the guys who worked on this bridge. And it was really nice to say, like, well, this is for Sal, you know? Um, and I told her, I said, that was my whole intention was to really think of a way to honor the people who built this thing that we rely on so much. So that's sort of this section here. So like, yeah, I mean, you can see these big pieces coming down, the smoke rising and the part. And these are some of the pieces of the bridge that really, they do feel like bones, you know. Mm -hmm. What's that? Yes. Yes. Did you actually draw the drawing? Um, yes, I wasn't there when they did that first uh, dynamite. I was not there, but yeah, you see like, See these big cats? Um, I was there while well, they would pull them, and it was, that's why I was across the street. <laughs> like, so yeah, I did see a lot of them. And these things felt, they kind of felt like dinosaurs because they would grab it, and then they would like keep tugging and tugging. Mm -hmm. and tugging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was they kind of look like they, they do, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. <laughs> Okay, so this section is called energetic felling, and this is again um, about that moment when they dynamited the bridge and these big pieces came came apart. And so this one in particular, the name of this painting is energetic felling, and in this one you can see more of the construction of the bridge, the actual bridge itself. So these are just you know like a back here, and these are just some of the pieces coming apart. Um, but again, you know, in these, in these, in this group specifically, I really wanted to think about dimension, right? And so the dimension of the pieces falling, but also the dimension of time, um, you know, how long it took to, to put this bridge and build this bridge, and then how quickly it took apart the dynamite. And these are all painting. This one has a little, little bits of cut paper on it, but. Um, this here, like some of these here, you can see very much some of the structure of the truss bridge. This is like inside the trusses and kind of this almost <clears throat> mirrored effect and infinity of the two spans that you can see over there, the two big pieces coming, coming apart together. Um, and this is the same thing. So, you know, in my mind's eye, I have different, different points of view of this bridge as it's falling. Yes. Over what span of time did you spend uh, doing drawings on? Uh, it, 
it was about two months. It took them once the, the, the initial detonation happened, it took them about two months, two months to cut it all up and part of the way. So you were there on and off? Yeah, like I mean if I wasn't teaching or like I'd say, all right, I'm gonna go Friday, or it was just sort of right. plotted out. Mm -hmm. um, I was there, some of these have rain on them, I was there in the rain. Right. Yeah, I mean it's it, it kind of gets addictive when you fly on location, especially something like this. You don't want to miss anything because I know they're gonna do something while I'm gone. So, you know, I a couple of days a week maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do any of these like full abstract on site there or pretty much from the these are all from the drawings? These are all from the drawings, but the drawings started to get some of them started to get more abstract than maybe I normally would do, just right. because there was you know, like what William was alluding to, things were falling as I was drawing them. You right. Know, so it became <clears throat> it became more about the movement of what was happening, even in the drawing, than it was about like actually drawing the bridge itself. You know, so kind of. I guess. Uh, uh, this okay. So this section is um, I was speaking about going, you know, going back and forth several times a week to the site and the, the workers at the site got to know me um, because, you know, that was sort of an unusual thing that somebody was <laughs> drawing it. And <clears throat> I got to the site one day and they were like, hey, it's the last piece. Hey, come here, Veronica, it's the last piece, you guys. So they brought me to see, which is so funny, right? The last piece, which is this. And they were like, <laughs> so, you know, I was like, okay. I mean, I'm happy to draw it. <laughs> So I drew the last piece of the bridge, and then I did this painting called The Last Piece, which is, again, kind of, there's a closer relationship between the drawing and the painting. Um, but, you know, honestly, I was very, I felt very honored to draw the last piece of the bridge that I had grown up my whole life loving and hating, right? So, uh, you know, it was, it was a historic moment, I, I felt. And you know the trust bridge is is really, and I like this connection here because it's really part of the machine age, and you know it's yeah we know a lot of the problems that the machine age brought in terms of the environment and in terms of the toll it took on people's health, but we also live here and have this life now because of the machine age. So it's this you know it's this uh, feeling that I have that I want to honor. What happened? Honor the people, honor the history, and all the emotion of that, and also honor what's happening now. We're in this funny transition, right? Of nature reclaiming and nature taking over, and this movement toward maybe I hope <laughs> wilding and getting back to a more natural, natural state of the environment. So this last piece is really an important piece because it's the connector, you know. Mm -hmm. This little corner is kind of very special to me. So that's that's the show. <laughs> um, thank you to Robert. Um, so we had such a great time. Uh, it was working a on wonderful this. experience. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was um, excited about it when I, like I said, when I first saw the saw it coming together, mm -hmm. and then going to this, your studio and seeing it, you know, full. Yeah, uh, that was yeah, and it yeah. was a great experience. Same I, here. I, I said, Veronica, I wish all the artists were, were as organized as Veronica is. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Neil? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's been great working with you. And it's, it's been a really terrific collaboration. It's so much fun having you come to the studio and just go through everything together. And um, yeah, and, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, yeah, maybe we can move the bridge piece. If yeah, you, guys want to you got it. Uh, all of the work is online. Uh, there's additional works from from the bridge series as well, probably 30 something more uh, pieces. Yeah. Um, yeah, online. <laughs> it's on uh, rcartsy.net and then just look for a merch gallery. Yes. Um, there's yeah. also some drawings in that one box. Uh, I think I think about nine. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a nice feeling that people want to release. I talked to all of them the night before the open. Let's <laughs> <laughs> just continue this theme of you know inanimate things being alive. But I I don't think of them. You know I think they are alive. I talked to them and I said 
you guys listen it's been great i enjoyed working with you and <laughs> now it's time to go to see new homes so thank you to anyone who's taking one home i appreciate it <laughs> okay all right great thanks everyone